This show is brought to you by the North Face. Now, the North Face have been my sponsors for the last eight or nine years, and I'm really proud to be involved with this fantastic outdoor brand. Now, they've been in the outdoor industry for over 50 years, and they are the premier supplier of authentic, innovative, and technologically advanced exploration apparel. For your footwear, equipment, accessories, they've got the best stuff. Now, their lightweight and weather-resistant flight series running gear is my absolute favorite. So, if if you're into trail running, if you're into desert running, if you're into just exploring our mountains, then these, this is the go-to gear. And it's designed to endure, engineered to help you through the heat, through heavy downpours, or whatever else comes your way so that you can run no matter what, every day, any weather, any terrain, and never stop exploring. If you'd like to check out their whole range, go to thenorthface.co.nz. <laughs> Welcome Welcome. to Pushing the Limits, the podcast that gets deep into the psyche of extraordinary achievers across all genres, cutting to the chase to unlock the secrets of their success, their achievement, philosophies, and motivations. Join us in the quest to find out what makes the movers and shakers of our world tick and what gems of wisdom we can learn from them. Now, over to your host, Lisa Tamati. Okay, so Neil, we're going to go over some injuries, some common injuries that people answered in the poll. We had 330 people reply on the, the poll, and we had massive uh, injuries with uh, knees, with lower back, with hips, uh, shin splints, and Achilles were the, the top five injuries that, that people were experiencing. And we're talking, you know, a huge amount of people had, had those, so from 50... 50 out of a, a 330 odd had um, uh, the number one thing was knees. So, Neil, let's start with knees. Getting that, how many were on knees, Lisa? It was quite a hard number there, wasn't it? Uh, it was a huge number. That was number one. I've forgotten the, uh, the actual amount of people, but knees were the biggest problem. So, knees is a pretty easy one to fix in many cases, isn't it? Uh, with yeah, a we find couple of tra- they're usually with the knees. A lot of people that we see getting knee pain lately, it isn't actually the knee. Okay, so it's not actually the knee. It's usually it's well worth looking below the knee, and well worth looking mm-hmm. above the knee. All right, so there's a lot of um, a lot of people we work in, work with who are coming in with knee pain, having trouble moving the knee joint properly, and we find that we work below the knee, release the foot, look at the muscles around the foot, look at the joints around the foot, and then go up top and look at the muscles around the hip, um, definitely around the hip joint. Um, around the glutes as well, and we find by releasing those, activating the muscles we should, often find that it releases the knee pain. So a common one that a lot yep. of people experience is issues with the ITB. Now the ITB... Yeah, this, this is the real common one that can be really, really easily fixed. So that, that as you, got, you know, is running down the side of the hip and running from the hip down to the side of the knee. So often as, as the issue is that the ITB starts to pull on the knee joint. So releasing the hip, in particular releasing the TFL and the soft tissue around the hip, will really start to make a big, big difference to how that knee's functioning. So just because you've got pain in one area, and those, those hundreds of people that get pain in the knee, is don't always assume that it's the knee causing the problem. And if you're getting told by your health professional that it's the knee you need to work on, ask them or go and ask someone else about looking above the knee and looking, um, looking below the knee. Yeah, because we have this thing called the kinetic chain. If we could perhaps um, explain to them uh, what the kinetic chain is and why so one part of the body can influence another part of the body. So we have to look, if we've got an injury, say, in the ankle or in the knee, that we always look above and below. Um, and sometimes even right up to the shoulder could be causing an injury in the knee, um, isn't it? So the kinetic chain, explain that a little bit, Neil. So ideally, the, I mean, the body's fully connected. So a good way of um, giving you an example is if you, you imagine keeping it real simple, you've got your calves that attach down at your foot, your calf muscles are attaching to your Achilles. They then come up to your knee. They then move upstairs. The calf crosses the knee joint, and then you've got the hamstrings behind the, behind the leg. They come up and attach to the hip. Then from the hip, you've got the lats on the back of your body that come all the way up your back, and they attach on the front of your shoulder. So if you've got slight tightness in the calf muscles or problems with the Achilles, that can start tightening the calf, which then tightens the hamstring, which then starts to pull on the pelvis, which then tightens the, tightens the lats, which then can pull the shoulder forward. So you might find... It's, it's, really, yeah, it's so, like having a... 
that's too tight in one place will pull it down in another place. So one of the, the if we can give them a couple of um, uh, exercises to do to release perhaps the ITB band, which is the most common uh, problem causing uh, the knee to be out of alignment and can, which can cause you know, runner's knee, you know, the tracking of the knee to be out. Um, how do they solve that very common problem before they go looking deeper? Is it, you know, of course it could be a meniscus tear or something along that nature, which might require surgery. But in the first instance, check, check for these sort of problems first, because it might be something as simple as a tight ITB band. So how do they release actually that that ITB band and that TFL? Well, first thing, the first mistake a lot of people make, Lisa, is they go and smash the ITB. So they go and roll up and down the ITB, and most people, I think you and I would agree, when you get on a, on a foam roller and put it on your ITB, normally you, you kind of you find the first few times you do it, it's quite, it's quite, it's quite painful. So the, the, you've got to remember the ITB, it's a big fibrous bit of tissue, and it should be a thick fibrous bit of tissue. So smashing it on a foam roller on a regular basis isn't necessarily going to help. What does help, though, is releasing the tissue that inserts into it. So always explore, explore the foam roller, a ball, um, one of the black roll balls, a cricket ball, something like that. Um, something that you can get into the, into the hip. Explore soft tissue around the hip. Spend some time around the soft tissue in the hip and seeing if you can release that. Now, you've got to control how much pressure and weight you're putting through it. So ideally, you get on and rate yeah. it on a scale of 1 to 10. 1 being nothing at all. 10 being, take this thing off me. This isn't, uh, this isn't, isn't helping. Okay, so... You want to find that you're getting up to sort of a 7, 8 out of 10 tops. And then we want to start bringing yeah. that score down to, to under a 5. When, when you do things daily, that really does get easier and easier and less painful. Yeah, totally. And it's got to be, it's got to be something that's consistent. Now, you should find over time that will, will release. If you, if you get on it and tense up, your body's not going to respond well either. So you want to get on, you want to breathe, you want to relax and enjoy it, and actually use your mind to imagine relaxing the muscles of the hip, all right? So don't tense up, don't hold your breath, breathe and no. relax, and let the, um, let the tissue unwind. But give the ITB, the actual ITB itself, a break. Don't hammer that, explore the tissue around it, let it relax after you've, you've released some of it with the rolling, then look at doing some stretching, okay? So some yoga okay. moves, um, anything that's gonna open the hip, and um, your simple hip stretches as well. Yeah, so th these are um, really common areas. Um, so insertion areas as well as the ITB band itself. So what about the insertion area into the actual knee area, or is that to be avoided? Again, I'd, I wouldn't go hard on your find that once you start to release the tissue around the hip. And again, I'd explore the quads as well. I'd explore the, the, the big tissue of the quads on the front of the leg. Releasing a lot of that will take the pressure off and help to realign, um, realign the hip which then starts to bring the knee back into alignment, okay? In, while you're doing that as well, it helps to give some activation of the glutes. So firing up mm -hmm. the glutes as well will give the, um, give the body some strength, give the hips some balance, and again, starts to give the knee, knee better alignment. So if the, if the glutes are doing their job, especially glute knees, glute backs, they're going to hold the knee in a better position. So we did a video, or I did a video recently on glute activation. Um, so a couple of the exercises there that you might want to try, guys, is things like the, the bridge, the floor bridge, where you can do them single leg four bridge, you can do it with a little mini band resistance if you want to find out, uh, check that video out. So activating the glutes as well as, so you, you're releasing the tension in the muscles on the one side and you're activating the muscles that you want activated on the other side. So that's the knee in a, in a nutshell. Of course, you know, if you're having real sharp pains, if you're having real problems, then obviously go and check it out with your doctor, with your surgeon, that, you know, you haven't got a torn meniscus or something like that. But in the first instance, if you're just having sore knees when you're starting to up the distances, then this, you know, can really, really help. Um, if we move down now from the knee into the um, Achilles, this is a real, um, you know, we did a... a uh, a Facebook Live on this uh, not so long ago as well on the Achilles because this is one of the most common problems with runners. Neil, give us a, a couple of bits of information on how you can deal with an Achilles tendonitis as, a, uh, as opposed to a, a ripped tendon um, and what we can do there. Again, giving it some, give it some love <laughs> is the most important thing. Don't keep hammering it with the running. So a couple of things you can, you, you obviously want to address. You want to give it time to, for the inflammation to go down. You want to give it time to, time to recover. Again, like we talked about with the knee, start to relax and release the tissue around it. So if the calves are tight, 
and the tissue above it is tight, start to give that some love and let, let that release. You can do that again through the rolling. See here a common theme, that you need to release tissue. Then you want to mm. lengthen it and then you want to activate the other, the other tissue that needs to be activated around it. So if you get used to thinking along those lines, you'll start to, start to get some good, good results. We're giving it time to, to release and relax the tissue around it. Also the tissue underneath the foot as well. So you've got the fascia all the way underneath your foot, around the arch of your foot and running the length of your foot, releasing that as well. If you've got tissue that's tight underneath the foot and tissue that's tight up in the calf, that's all going to be really, really pulling on that Achilles. So releasing that mm. will, help, will help as well. One of the great tools that we've got uh, in our arsenal is a, a black roll mini foam roller. These are like, you know, everyone knows the big foam rollers, but this is like a little wee mini one. And that's really great for rolling the foot out and rolling the calf muscles out, as is uh, so a broomstick even. Just getting that on the, on the calf muscles and going across the fibres there and just releasing the tension in the muscles there. So if you're releasing the calf muscle, in other words, and if you're releasing the foot is what you're saying, Neil, and mobilising the foot, it can actually help the Achilles rest, of course, rest ice and compression and elevation in, 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 uh, in the, the acute scenario. Uh, what if, you know, if it's, a, if it's an actual rupture, if it's an actual, and you've heard a big crack happen and there's been an accident, obviously you've probably ruptured the Achilles tendons and then you obviously need to get to the doctor quick smart and see what it is. Um, but if it's just inflammation along the Achilles tendon, um, then that's you know tendonitis and not uh, you can start to work on it gently doing some of these release things. So then what about a couple of uh, strengthening exercises? I think the other thing just to try and as well, Lisa, is that a lot of this can be pre prevented because most people that, that we're seeing and working with will start addressing the issue when they get the niggle. So yeah. they start to get the niggle, they get the inflammation, they get the pain and by that point it's often too late. So by addressing it on a daily basis, doing a little bit each day and looking after it consistently, and it can be as little as five, ten minutes a day, then you're going to, you're going to stop seeing these, these issues coming up and you're going to stop having as, as much pain. The other thing to address the Achilles as well is looking at your run technique. So how you're positioning your body when you're running and obviously making sure you've got the mobility and flexibility through the feet and the lower limbs, but making sure that you position your foot right when you're, um, when you're running as well. So where you're striking the floor, how you're landing, how much weight is going through your body and how much ground reaction force is coming back through the ground into your foot makes a huge, massive difference as well. Yeah, one of the problems that we often see is when people's heels aren't kissing the ground when they're running and they're just bouncing on them and it's like a rubber band that just gets overstretched and, and a hell of a lot of tension put on it. Um, if you're doing a massive, if you've upped your mileage, if you've upped your speed work or you've upped your hill work recently and you're suddenly getting niggles, those are common areas that you might want to pull back on for a while until the Achilles starts to, you know, come back right. Um, another thing you often see with Achilles problems is that uh, it's the first signs of problems are when it's stiff in the morning and you wake up and you get out of bed and it's just a little bit stiff, but later on in the day it's fine, that's, a, that, that's an early warning sign and a sign that's when you can actually do some real good by preventing an actual real problem coming on. So if you're starting to have that little bit of stiffness in the morning when you get up, but by later on it's okay, uh, or conversely when you're actually doing a really big long run and it starts to get uh, sore, you know, the longer you run, then obviously yeah, it's an overuse uh, injury and you, you want to be dealing with it. Um, another uh, facet of this is, is looking at the anti-inflammatory situation, and I, you know I'm not a big uh, fan of uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories if you can avoid them. They have their place, obviously, in an acute injury, uh, but just for you know you've got a little bit of pain, you've got a little bit of stiffness and stuff. Don't grab to those if you can't if you can avoid it. Uh, grab to some more natural remedies like uh, turmeric is a really really good one as an anti-inflammatory to take. Water, yeah, thanks, Neil. Tell them about water. Why water is so important for your tendons and your ligaments and your, your muscles. Fascia, the fascia, which is a good way to imagine imagine that is uh, it's almost like a, like chicken skin or a protective skin that's covering all the all the systems, all the structures, all the muscles in your body. That loves to be hydrated. So if that gets if that gets tight, if the fascia gets tight, you imagine it like a, an old leathery belt. It doesn't want to move well. It's gonna it's gonna crack. It's gonna be be tough to move. So if you're waking up like you're saying in the morning lease and you're getting those niggles and your body's feeling stiff and uncomfortable, then a lot of the time a lot of that can be solved by making sure you're having enough of enough of that stuff. So if you've got enough of the yep. enough of the water and you've got enough of your body size and good quality water, 
it's going to hydrate. Your, your, yeah. your fascia should be like a sponge. You want to be able to wring that out. And if you're trying to wring it out and you're wringing it out and there's nothing in it, then guess what? When you wake up in the morning, it's going to hurt. It's a real simple, be- easy way to, to take some inflammation out of the body is, is up your hydration. And we're often looking for other other state-of-the-art things to do it when often the answer is right in front of us and it's simply increasing your hydration. On top of that, go to bed a bit earlier. Okay, your body will recover from an injury a whole lot better if you if you're getting the sleep you should. Okay, so the yeah. sleep if you're getting the sleep you should for your body for your body type, going to bed at the time you should, getting up when you should, then that's when your body's going to grow. It's going to be when it's going to develop, and it's going to be when it's going to recover. And it's that recovery with these injuries that we're talking about. Often people get the continuous injuries because they're dehydrated and they're just not getting enough rest and still doing the same volume of training. Yeah, and why why is sleep going to bed earlier? And this is one that we uh, have trouble with me with because I work late at night and I'm trying to change my ways. But anyway, sleep before midnight and you know the sleep after midnight. What's the difference there, Neil? So your body's gonna, especially the getting to bed between ten and two, your body will recover from a physical point of view in that time period. So getting into bed ideally ten to four will will help help massively, especially if your body needs recovery. Now, you'll often know when your body needs recovery because you'll be picking up more niggles and injuries, and you'll start to feel that your body's just not moving as well as it was. So a lot of people that completed completed the poll, I'm sure it's prior to them picking up the injury, they just felt their body wasn't operating as well as it, as well as it could be. So if you want that physical recovery, that response, getting to bed pre-10 o'clock, your body will do a lot of its curry between 10 p.m. And, and 2 a.m. So if that's the case and you're getting into bed at midnight, and then getting up to run before you go to work, and you're wondering why you're coming back, and you're like, knees are hurting, my Achilles is sore, <laughs> my feet are tight, then you, you've kind of got your answer there. So that's the question I'd get all the viewers to go and look at initially straight away is, is how, how well hydrated are you, and how well are you, how well are you sleeping? We've actually got at Running Hot Coaching a really good checklist uh, that, that Neil's developed that gives you, you've got your training plan and your calendar, right? And it says X amount of kilometers at X amount of speed and, and, and this tempo run and that fart look run here and so on. But if you do a checklist every day before you go out and do your training, you can actually judge how prepared you are for that training session and whether you need to adjust things a little bit because the stress levels in your life are too much you, or you've uh, had poor nutrition, you've had poor ni- uh, hydration or you, the kids were up all night and you didn't get enough sleep. And it gives you this just this great checklist to say, yeah, actually I'm on point today. I reckon I can go and smash it and do what's on the training plan or no, um, I've got an interval session planned for today, but I've had a dreadful last couple of days. I'm really not up for it and shifting things around a little bit. So it's learning to be intuitive with the training plan, not just being arbitrary with, okay, this is what this is what the coach said or this is what the training plan said and doing things in an arbitrary nature and not listening to the body. Yeah, keep keep on top of that and keep keep checking checking those things. It should be a mental checklist. We use it as an actual one that people fill in. Um, encourage our athletes to do it on a regular basis because you, you want to be thinking like that all the time. A lot of the niggles yeah, we're so seeing now that, are, that the athletes we're working with have had are starting to go away because they're, they're thinking about the other things outside of the training. So it's not just the training yeah. itself. It's we, We've got athletes come through that have had the knee pain, that have had the ankle pain, the Achilles pain, and we're starting to see less and less of that because people are addressing the other bits in their, in their life. It's, the training is one yeah. part of it, but it's the other bits, the other way you look after your body as well. And this is like the, the holistic approach that we take to training, which is really based on the five pillars. So you've got your run sessions, your drills, your technique, your, your tempo sessions, your fart lick, your hill training, your long, slow distance runs, all of those sort of things. Um, but then in the other part of the equation, and this is the parts that often ne- get neglected, is this mobility that we're talking about, this myofascial release, massage, Pilates, yoga, all of these things would come under that category. And then you've got your run-specific strength training where you're actually preparing the body and the different parts of the body for the rigors that you're going to put it through with, with running because you need to be strong in the right places in order to be able to withstand the mileage that you're going to put it through. And then, yes, of course, your nutrition, your supplementation, hydration, all that. And another big part of the puzzle that I really specialize in is the mindset and motivation type of uh, area because this you know you can have the best training plans in the world but if your mind's not and if you don't have the confidence if you're if you're doubting everything 
uh, you're panicking, you're, you're not, you know, you're not got your mind in a good place, then you, you're going to struggle as well. So all of these things make up a really holistic run program. And this is why like just downloading a spreadsheet from the internet only gives you a piece of the puzzle. Um, and the way we approach also our training systems is that we don't have, we are not big on the old high mileage, traditional old high mileage models. They do work in, in the aspect that they will get you across the finish line. And that's how I trained for many years. And I did cross the finish line of many massive races doing so. However, it's not the most efficient manner to train. And it's not a, a, a manner of training that will give you longevity in the sport that will help you avoid overtraining injuries and all of that sort of stuff. And it's also great if you're a 20 year old or a 25 year old athlete and you, you're an elite athlete and you haven't got any injury issues, you haven't got a full time job and three children children and, and financial worries and stress and, you know, at home, uh, which is all part of this puzzle. If you if you have a really busy life, then you do not want to be just going into the massive high mileage and neglecting the other parts of this training. So that's why we've developed our systems to be a very holistic looking approach at the person and at their health. And, and we get people in sometimes and we actually look at the health situation first and go, we need to send you know you off to, we've got different programs that we have like epigenetics and boost camp, health camp, before we go back into the full on training, if they're having some major issues. Um, but if we go back, Neil, and have a look at the next one on the list that was really, really common is lower back pain. And this is something that, yeah, I can you know sing a song about. Okay. <laughs> um, told you in a, in a short story of my back injury, uh, I broke my back when I was 21, like I broke two vertebrae, but the spinal cord was intact, thank goodness, otherwise I wouldn't be walking around today and I'm still running. Um, however, two of the discs were crushed, and as I went through my running career, and of course I've run, you know, over 70,000 kilometres in the last 25 years, and now I've got four discs that are absolutely kaput, and I had uh, major problems with spasms, you know, like, I was just spasming all, all the time right throughout the day. It got to a point where I couldn't carry backpacks. I couldn't do uh, multi-day stage races. I would go out and run. As soon as I'd stop running, I'd have another spasm. And it got to the point where I thought my career was at an end. And I went to surgeons. I went to you know chiropractors, acupuncture, pretty much everything I could possibly think of, massage. And nothing helped and nothing helped and nothing helped. And uh, through working with Neil, he said to me, look, uh, You've always had a weak core, and I've got some proof in some really old photos that uh, I used to be bent over like a staple, eh, Neil? I still used to do the distances, but I didn't look very good and strong by the end of them. And so we started really doing a really strong uh, core program. Uh, Neil, explain why the core is so important for the back, and then I'll continue the story there. Well, it's, it's the core is where every part of your movement should come from. So every, everything should start from the core out and you should start with getting your, your deep core stabilizers tight. So a lot of people, again, will end up with um, especially niggles in the back because they're, they're trying to use all the other muscles to control their lumbar pelvic hip complex and support the spinal column. They're trying to use everything else to support it when it should be those deep stabilizers. Now, if the deep stabilizers aren't going to do the job, then and the core's not supporting the spine as it should, the lower back's going to start to hurt. The other thing is a lot of people uh, sitting as we are now, Lisa, and yeah. they're going to get very tight as a result of that, often tighten the hips. Because you're flexed and the, the hip joint is, is, is bent and get tight through those muscles. And then you go out to do your activity and you've still got some degree of bend in that hip. So you need to do everything you can to get the hip fully open and get the glutes mm -hmm. doing the job they should. So often when the, the hips get tight, that starts to change the position of the pelvis. The pelvis starts to mm -hmm. tilt forward. Imagine a bucket of water, full of water. And as the pelvis starts to tilt, you're spilling water over the front. The hips then get tight. The muscles of the glutes start to get long. And then that starts to load the lower back. So you imagine that happening when you're then running and putting the ground reaction forces you get from running through your body. All of a sudden, there's a great deal of load going through the, through the lower back and the spine. So it's working yeah. out if it's, if it's related. Yours was obviously related to the, the spine itself. But it can often be quite simple. It can often be soft tissue. And by repositioning yeah. the hips, by opening up the hips with some good stretching, activating the glutes, doing some good deep core work to stabilize the core, all of a sudden that pelvis starts to reset itself and the, the, the back pain starts to disappear, which is obviously yeah. happy happy days. And you don't finish the, the, the race like you used to. Yeah. Used to be like that by the yeah. end of a 100 miler. 
and, and to cut a long story short with my back, you know, uh, even though I've still got four discs that are totally buggered um, and I shouldn't be able to do what I do, I actually have no pain anymore. And I haven't had a spasm for over four years because I do a hell of a lot of core work. And, I, and we're not just working on your six pack. It's not about your, your, your nice six pack and, you know, it's great to have those, but um, it's more important that the whole, the deep core, uh, the quadratus lumborum, the lower back, all of this area is strengthened and strong so that you can stabilize. This is especially important for women, especially for women if you've got wider hips, if you've had uh, you know, a number of children, um, all of these things can make that area a little bit looser uh, and you have to do a little bit more work on it to stabilize. You'll often see women, for example, sort of running cross, cross over, the hands are crossing over, the, the knees are going one way, the hips are going the other way, and that's all yeah, a weakness in the, in the hip area and the lower back area and the, and the glutes that needs to be addressed before they can run faster and before they can run more efficiently. And the other thing yeah. just to add in there, Lisa, Anything to add there? Every, everything you're describing is, yeah, is spot on, but you were describing about instability in the hips there, that, that technique of moving, and the movement then that causes, like we were talking about at the start of the, at the, start of the session, was that how everything's connected. So you stabilise the core, and then all of a sudden that stabilises the hips, which then means the knee doesn't start to continue to fall in like it used to because you've got some sort of stability up top to hold it so if the knee's not falling in if the arch of your foot isn't caving in now because you've developed more stability then all of a sudden guess what those 300 odd people who were talking about having a, a knee pain now they haven't got any knee pain yeah. because the core's holding them in a much better better position yeah absolutely so if you've got a bad back make sure you uh, get well you need to be doing a lot of core work there, you need to also graduate your core work. Don't just, you know, start out doing one leg of burpees, please. You know, like it's not where you start. Um, you know, you need to build up your strength as you go. Otherwise, you can injure yourself by doing the wrong sort of um, core movements as well too early in the pace. So, Neil. So, um, the other one, so, uh, sorry, Claudine, one the... it's just a, a real winner that's an easy takeaway is, is breathing. So, when you're talking about the core, good breathing technique, using your diaphragm to breathe is, is a real winner winner as well. The diaphragm will, is key to core stabilization as well. So you want to make sure that that's working as it should be. And then if you're breathing as you should be, it allows the rest of the body to relax and do what it wants to, which again helps some of that, that tension be removed. So focus as well, like we talked about sleep and we talked about water, things outside of the training, focus on breath control as well. And you can jump on um, to either Lisa's site or Running Hot Coaching and check out the some of the blogs on breathing. Um, because yeah, there, you, you take the time to get your breathing technique right. It makes a huge, huge difference. It's a real, real winner. Throughout the day, doing deep diaphragmatic breathing to lower your stress levels, lower the cortisol release, lower the adrenaline release, help you with nerves before a race, help you get more in control of your psyche. There's a whole lot of benefits outside of running that the, um, the breathing technique bring into it. So what, on that breathing thing, Neil, too, when you, like if you look at some of the old pictures where before I met you and you saved my career, um, when I was broken and burnt out athlete, I came to Neil and he basically rebuilt my body and rebooted the way I trained and the way I approached everything and, and got me on a really good strength program and sort of kick-started it. But before we, uh, I remember doing a 100 miler around uh, Mount Taranaki and you came with me and you've got some photos of me looking like a staple coming in towards, you know, the 150k mark. Um, my breathing had gone, my digestion had gone. Uh, all of these things are a knock-on effect of not having a strong core as well. Um, and, and even upper body, not being able to be able to hold your shoulders back and your neck back, you know, you start to get this hunched over thing. And that, of course, means that your breathing and your digestion aren't working. And, of course, uh, your, your digestion is under a hell of a load when you're doing, say, ultra marathons anyway. Um, and, you know, so all of these things can start to add up to be major, major problems um, as you start to get, in, especially into the longer distances, you, you usually get away with it on the shorter stuff. But as you get more fatigued and as you lose these sort of things, you know, definitely your digestion and, and your breathing can can fall into it as well. One of the other injuries, that, or two of the others, are sh shin splints and plantar fasciitis. So, so plantar fasciitis first, Neil. This is a bloody awful thing, eh? And it yeah, can take a long time, often a long time uh, to come back from it. Yeah, yeah, can really knock you for a six. So yeah, often often a long time to come come back for it. So again, similar similar things. And it, it, if it's getting repetitive now, then that's a good thing because that means hopefully that, that everyone that's, that's watching will start to get the message. So <laughs> it, it, if if we are repeating ourselves, in great. So again, the thinking of the basics, the hydration, 
the sleep, the good, the good food. Um, and just making sure that a real nice one that we've got some good results with is we talked about the rolling um, and the benefits of um, foam rolling and self myofascial release. It's a real nice to, we often recommend locally that people use a water bottle. So just get a small water bottle, something similar to that, stick it in the freezer and then yep. roll the cold, cold bottle across the foot. Real gentle to start and real slow while it's recovering. But the, the, the cold is quite soothing for the foot. And then the, the rolling technique has the same effect on the fascia as, as foam rolling will. So that helps. Yep. It, it, it will depend on the, the extent of it. If it's very painful, then obviously go and get it checked out. Make sure there's nothing else going, going on there. But, but that will help, again, as well, releasing the tissue above the foot. So coming back to releasing the calf muscles, either through foam rolling and then stretching and letting yep. those, those do their job. Spending some time as well, just letting your feet come out of your shoes. Um, we, we're great at covering our feet up a lot of the time, so we lose contact with the, with the ground. It's not, we, we always keep these out, our hands out, and they're big sensory to let us know what's going on. They, they tell us what we need to do, what's hot, what's cold. But our feet, for some reason, we, we cover up. So get the feet out at yep. some point during the week, even if it's around the home, around the house, going for a walk on the beach. Get them out and let them start to relax. As they start to relax, you'll see that you actually get some distance between your toes and the foot actually starts to relax. A lot of runners we see, their toes up, the feet, the feet are like this. Letting them relax takes the, takes the tension cool. off the fascia underneath the foot and again lets it start to relax. Give it the time it needs though. Don't get into the cycle of feels a bit better this week. So I'm going to head out and do my run and then wonder why it's so sore when I come back. Let it recover for a few days and just end up in that cycle that long term is going to end, to end in it causing some sort of major, major problem. And looking with the, um, the Achilles, because so, there's a word of warning there, don't go around too much bare feet all at once. If you haven't been used to it, sure. you know, do it in like 10 to 15 minutes like in increments and and this is uh also for your achilles if you've got achilles problems if you go around flat footed and you know bare feet you know that can cause uh problems as well and you shouldn't go around with high heels on either ladies because um both of those things can aggravate the the um achilles tendon the other thing as well so, Lee, sorry uh, to jump in is um i think you've done a couple of videos as well with the flossing so at the, yeah, at the right yeah. time at the right time in the recovery and and guys i check out some of lisa's lisa's videos or she can share them afterwards but Flossing around that, that foot, which basically the flossing is a, a, a piece of rubber that you, you're going to wrap and compress the foot, um, the, the, um, the Achilles area, and then move it through a range of motion once it's wrapped, and then release it, causing the joint to flush, and it gives a similar effect as, as rolling wood as well. So again, allows helps with the recovery, allows it to relax. You see, to make sure you're doing it at the right time in the, in the recovery. Yeah, so all of these things can add up. I really do enjoy the flossing. I know my husband does it every single day. He's sort of addicted to that feeling of the blood rushing through it, I think, and cleaning it out. <laughs> so um, last one is, is shin splints. I've got a tip here for shin splints before you get on to the more common sort of uh, things to do for shin splints, which is obviously, again, rolling and that sort of thing. But one of the things to check is, and this can be just with inflammation on the uh, top of your leg there, on uh, lower legs, are your shoelaces too tight? Often we buy shoes that are too small, and this is very common. When you go into a running shop, yeah, even good uh, reputable uh, running shop, often you have uh, problems with the fact that you're going in cold, you haven't been for a run that day, and your feet swell quite a lot when you're doing long distance running. So if you tie your shoelaces up, they're, they're normal tight when you go out the door, but you say you're running for a, a 20K or you're doing a 30K long long run before a marathon or something like that, and your feet swell, and then it cuts off the circulation into the upper foot there, and you can get real bad inflammation on the top of your foot and also in your shin splints. And I've had this in, um, I had this in one particular 338-kilometer ultramarathon that I was doing in Germany years ago, and on day two, we were doing 70 k's a day, and I was just in hellish pain in the shins. And an old codger who'd been around for many years said to me, love, you should chop, open up, chop your, your socks and open them up so you've got no tension around that ankle and, and open up the shoelaces as far as you possibly can. So I actually cut all my socks, opened them all up, and that helped release a lot of the damage was already done in that case. But that can uh, be one of the reasons why you're getting uh, pressure here. It's just a straight, you know, 
uh, you, you're blocking off the blood getting back up, if you like, and it's causing massive inflammation. So that's just a little tip. Make sure that your uh, shoelaces aren't too tight and, you, and your socks aren't too tight. Um, but what, what else can you do for shin splints, Neil? Okay, similar, same process, which we're, again, hopefully getting the message across now, Lisa, is, is take the time to do your rehab and prehab work. So release the tension around it. There's different descriptions and different degrees of what people will call shin splints. Some can get quite severe and needs, um, needs need some good rest and need some time off your feet. Um, but often we can get some real big wins with all the things we've been talking about, and that's literally by releasing the soft tissue, releasing the soft tissue around the, around the lower limbs, around the hips and thighs, so that everything around that area is stopping to pull so tight on it. Once the muscles have started to relax, they're, they're not pulling as tight. Another thing to remember with that as well is as you start to create more movement, remember as you create more movement, you'll get more range of motion through the ankle, you'll get more range of motion through the hip. So a real key thing to remember is that you use that motion, that new range of motion cleverly. So all of a sudden, if you can move better because you've freed up the muscles around the, around the foot, around the knee, around the, um, around the hip, then bear in mind you're going to be able to run more comfortably, you're going to be able to squat deeper, but if you haven't got control with it, that's what can lead to injury as well. So we have seen some people that have given themselves a lot more range of motion but haven't added the strength component in with it. Does that make sense? So when you're Absolutely. Work, when you're working with the, you know, releasing the, and a lot of people will often say, I've got really bad shin splints, they do what you do, which is give their foot some more space, release the soft tissue, and all of a sudden that tension just releases and the comfort, the comfort's back, and it's not quite as extreme as they first thought it would, the first thought it, thought it was. And making so sure word, you're strengthening uh, afterwards. All right, you, so, you need to release tension. Build up the strength on the other side, because if you don't, you don't, you don't want to be a floppy rag doll, do you? You don't want to be overstretched, <laughs> and you don't want to be too tight, uh, and you want to be strong and, and functional. And if when you have full range of motion, why is that important for run technique, Neil? The the range of motion. I mean, the runners need good what's known as good dorsiflexion, so they need good range of motion through the through the ankle. If you haven't got good range of motion through the ankle, then your body's going to, as your foot hits the ground, your body's going to compensate somewhere further up. That's why people often get, as we talked about, knee pain, hip pain, because their body's having to bend in a different way. Your body's extremely good at finding the path of least resistance. So if something's locked up or not working as it should, or when shin splints is causing pain, the body will try and adapt and adjust technique and body position to reduce that pain, okay, or to comp compensate for it. So as you release the tension, then the same thing will happen in reverse. It's now got a new range of motion. It's like, hang on, I can now move more comfortably. But that's when, oh, that starts to that starts to hurt a little bit. So good, some good examples for you, Lise. If, you, if you're releasing the calves, think about tightening and strengthening the muscles of the tib anterior that run up the front of your leg. So you've now got an ankle yep. and a foot that, that are well well supported and that, that have got good, good structure. Same with the hip. If you're yep. going to release the hip, then think about um, giving some strength to the glutes. So you've got a hip yep. that's got stability and control. So when you go and run on it, it it's, it's held in place as it, as it should be. So the control is the, the key part as well. You want range of motion, but you also want good control with it. Range of motion without control is going to lead to as many injuries as, as tight muscles does as well. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, if, if, you're, um, if, you're, if you're up in the mileage, if you've got a big race goal coming up, uh, we'd love to help you, of course, um, at Running Hot Coaching. And uh, we take this holistic, this really holistic approach. Um, and we, we don't know too many coaches who have that really holistic uh, program dealing with all of these. They might have bits and pieces of it, but um, and especially in, in the, the mindset side of things and motivation as well, um, really big on that. And, and helping people get to the race in the best shape possible in the most time efficient manner possible. Just to give you guys a little bit of history about Neil and I, so we've been training together for over 10 years. Neil was my coach. And I came to him when I was completely burnt out. Was it not 2007? Uh, where I came back from Austria. I'd been living over there for 13 years. I'd done a hell of a lot of races over there, but I'd, I'd end up completely blowing myself to pieces. And, and Neil really uh, came along and really rebuilt the whole way I trained. He cut down my mileage, uh, which was protested vehemently <laughs> because I thought to run long, you need to run long. And that's all you need to do. <laughs> and yeah, we'll get you across the line. But it was also a good way to get hormone imbalances. Uh, I put on weight. I was like training more than ever and I was putting on weight. I couldn't work that one out. I had a really weak upper body. I had a weak core. I had the back pain. 
uh, I was feeling burnt out and depressed and all that sort of thing. And so Neil, when he came along, he said, right, we're going to introduce you to mobility work, to strength work. And really, my my, sky, my, my career skyrocketed after that, um, you know, within the, my potential. And I did a whole lot of massive international races uh, and had the best years of my career Um and then I, I crashed and burned again a little bit later because I just did too many back-to-back. -back. I ignored Neil, who said, you need recovery. And I said, nah, I'm a superwoman. I can do it all. And I uh, did back-to-back-to-back. -to -back -to -back. I mean, in one, you know, one 18-month period, I ran Death Valley twice, qualified with a 24-hour race. You know, I won the Nationals at the 24-hour race and went to England, did the national um, in the national team over there, 24-hour racing, ran the entire length of New Zealand, which was 2,250 kilometres in 42 days for charity, uh, wrote a book, ran a business, um, and all of this in the space of 18 months, and, and ran in a whole lot of other 100K nationals and, and all of these sort of things. And within that 18-month that period, I completely... I don't say that to brag. I'm telling you not what not to do because I, at the end of that 18 months, you know, Neil had a hell of a mess to, to, to fix up again uh, when I went crawling back and said, maybe you were right. <laughs> maybe I need to uh, concentrate on one or two events a year. And uh, to be honest, and, and Gary Moller, who was watching then, knows some of the aftermath of, of what I've done um, and, and got some major um, damage from, from what I did to myself. And therefore... What we're trying to say is that I've made all the mistakes. I've, we've got, we have a hell of a lot of experience. Between us, we've got 45 years experience doing the toughest events in the world and coaching for, for many, many years. Um, and we've also made every mistake under the sun. And we've developed these systems to really help people uh, shortcut it, make it easier for them, help them avoid, if, if they'll listen, uh, from going down the wrong paths and ending up with injuries, with overtraining, with burnout, with hormonal imbalances, with, you know, kidney troubles and all of the sort of stuff that, yeah, I've, I've gone and done to myself over the years. So <laughs> learn from my mistakes. Uh, listen to Neil. He knows what he's doing. He's saved my career a couple of times. And if you're wanting any help with any of this, then uh, please come and check us out and, and at Running Hot Coaching. And um, what we'd love you all to go and do is to download our free online run training e-course, which you can get at runninghotcoaching.com uh, forward slash running hyphen success. Neil, have you got any more, uh, anything to add to any of those, the injuries side of things or to, you know, the way we've trained? I think yeah, you, you said we've, we've, we've definitely made a lot of mistakes over the years and are happy to share those. And that way is that that allows us to, that will allow you to, everyone that's watching, to shortcut and not end up with the injuries and niggles. You must go and check out Gus's uh, podcast that I did with her just a, a couple of weeks ago on my podcast, Pushing the Limits. She's a superstar. Actually, her her interview was watched almost as many times as Dinkin Asses, and she was number two in my, all my, out of all my episodes. I know I've had some superstars on there, but Gus's interview really resonated with people. This is a, a woman who is a chartered accountant. She's a mild mannered accountant by day. <laughs> Anyone who knows Gus would know that's a laugh. But she started off running half marathons. I met her just before she did her first half marathon and uh, has gone on with uh, after working with us to doing um, one ultra marathon after the other, going from you know 100 milers to the 330k Alps to Ocean, Northburn 100 miler, uh, and all this fantastic stuff. And now at the age of 50, has hit her best milestones ever. And, and Gus will freely admit she's not your natural athlete. She's struggled with asthma. She's reckons she's not the right shape or the right uh, genes for, for running. And we just absolutely love working with people like her because uh, she's got the guts and the determination. And she, you know, if, if Neil says do this, she says, you know, um, yep, uh, how high, you know. If she's, he says jump, she says how high. Um, and so, you know, we've got lots of people like that that we've worked with over the years. We've got Greg Orr from Norway, who I'm accompanying over to Death Valley with my husband this year. We're crewing for him. We've managed to get him qualified to that mammoth race. And, you know, it's inch by inch, little by little. And we've got lots of other, you know, people that are just starting their journey. We love working with beginners as much as we love working with experienced athletes. We're not really interested in the elites. The elites will do what they want to do. I'm really interested more in people who've had a struggle and a journey like myself and who aren't natural athletes and who want to do it anyway and have got, you know, like Neil, you know, three kids, two businesses to run and still manages to find time to, to be extremely fit and extremely 
uh, inspirational. So those are the sorts of people that we love working with. So, you know, if you want to come and join us, please do. So thanks very much, everybody, for joining us today. Please share this with your, your friends. And um, if you've got any questions, please contact uh, either me or Neil, neil at runninghotcoaching.com or lisa at runninghotcoaching.com and check out our programs and, yeah, let us know how you go. Thanks, guys. See you soon, guys. That's it for this episode of Pushing the Limits with your host, Lisa Tamati. Please don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe and share all this goodness with your networks so we can impact more lives with positive insights and inspiring conversations. And check us out online at www.lisatamati.co.nz.